Praise the Lord. That was all well coordinated, wasn't it? Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. God's good. I appreciate it. Thank you, uh, Tim. Great job, as always. And Suzanne and Peter and Tammy, thank you for leading us in worship. The songs uh, went uh, right along with what Tim was saying. I've been talking about, he opened up talking about the light of the world and uh, something that uh, God's been talking to me about, and that's what I want to talk to you about this morning in a roundabout way, which is the only way I know how to talk, so praise the Lord. But God is good, amen, and uh, amen. He is on the throne, praise the yes. Lord. Did you know why uh, Adams are Catholic? Because they have mass. A-T-O-M-S, Adams. So I'm a, everything I'm going to talk about here this morning, I, I stayed with the Bible, okay, so because I'm getting feedback all the time. And by the way, uh, to all of those out in uh, the ether world on uh, the live stream, hello, thank you for being with us. Uh, Darlene and Don, but uh, many others as well, and so we appreciate you being a part of the service and uh, sharing this time with us and the Lord. Amen. Amen. So God bless you, and wherever you are, you're with Jesus. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Remember the story about Boaz, you know, the kinsman? Yes. Do you know what kind of a guy he was before he married Ruth? There really isn't a whole lot of history, but I'm just curious if anybody... He was ruthless. <laughs> They're just as bad when they're biblical as when they're not, praise the Lord. How about this? Do you know which Bible character had no parents? Think, think deep. Peter, I know you're, it's just rolling through his head right now. Time travel. Not time travel, no. It was Joshua. He was the son of Nun. Okay, I'll let you go with this one. I know we know that Adam was created on the sixth day, right? Mm -hmm. Do you know what time of day he was created? Just a little before Eve. Uh. <laughs> oh, yeah. Praise the Lord. <laughs> I know sometimes we smile because it's the only thing you can do, right? <laughs> Praise the Lord. Anyway, God bless you all. Appreciate your patience uh, as I go through those. I just have to. It's almost a, an addiction anymore. But. So I want to talk to you a little bit here before I actually get right down into the meat of the message, but uh, I want to kind of preface uh, what I want to talk to you about this morning with this. Now, Paul used the word uh, pleroma a lot, and, and which simply is, the tra it translates into English as fullness. And he used that expression a lot throughout his writings. And uh, so pleroma or fullness is, is one thing. And then I want to talk to you about how God, we're talking about light, you know, and Jesus came as the light to the world, and, and uh, we have become that light, right? We were born again and all this. So think about a prism. And you all remember probably in grade school or in a science class somewhere, you, they would get the prism out, and, you know, you'd hold it up to, the, and it would refract, and then you'd get all the other, uh, every, all the colors that are in the spectrum, you know, so... But it's just white light. You shine a white light in it, and you get all this. So in optics, a, uh, it's a transparent body, like, like glass, that's used for refracting or dispersing light into the spectrum. So uh, dispersing the fullness, right? So the prism of pleroma, or the dispensing of fullness, is Jesus the Son of God, through whom God, the Father, has manifest all His glory, all of His fullness, all of His purpose, and all of His power. So through that one, amen, comes everything that we see, amen, of God. So in John chapter 20, let's look at this, John chapter 20, verse 21. Just try to bear with me here for a little bit till I can get kind of moved, but I want us all to be on the same page here if, that's, if we can, praise the Lord. So John 20, 21, then said Jesus to them again, peace be unto you, as my Father has sent me, even so send I you. That's, 
powerful and it's extremely important and I don't think we pay enough attention to it. But the reason Jesus came and the, or, or as he came is the same way he sends us. Amen? No difference. Praise the Lord. So white light is not the absence of color. We're still talking about prisms here. But actually it's the convergence of every color. And we've all seen what happens when a beam of light, like I said, is split passing through a prism. Whether it's a raindrop, you know, we've all seen it. Whether it's a, a, an angled piece of glass, a crystal, a jewel of some kind, or just dew on a blade of grass, you get to see basically a rainbow. Amen? Because light separates into these component colors in that spectrum is then manifest all of the colors of the rainbow. So Jesus, the light of the world, now stay with me, Jesus, the light of the world, is sent by the Father into our world in pristine white light. Praise the Lord. And the scripture says, now again, though our sins are as scarlet, they'll be white as snow. He gives us a robe of righteousness whiter than white. Amen? Or you could say white light. So Jesus is the composite of the spectrum of God's fullness. In other words, he's everything. If we're using the analogy of a prism, he's the white light that reveals every color that there is. He is the image of God that reveals all that God is. Praise the Lord. And so... John 1, verse 16 and 17. And I want, to see, I want you to see how we fit into this. Jesus came as the revelation of God for a reason. He said so that we could be the same thing. All right? So of his fullness have all we received and grace for grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. So of his fullness or you could say spectrum, we've all received it, right? Because we've become white like Jesus, white in the sense of light here I'm talking about. Amen. And so uh, that, he says, we have received what? The fullness of grace. All right, Colossians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. See, this is why it's so crazy to think of racial things. I don't care if it's Hispanic, if it's Asian, if it's... Uh, African American, black, white, doesn't matter because that's what he's trying to show us. Jesus came as this white light. He, not that he was white, but that he was the image of God that reflected or refracted all of humanity. Every, we're all the same. We all come out of the same light, right? So it isn't white or black or yellow or green or red or any. It's, it's he is the light of the world and it's through him that we view everything. If we don't, we're missing it. We're, we're looking at things the wrong way. Okay, so in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. So we have the fullness of grace, we have the fullness of power. Yes. Yes. Amen. Yes. All right, Ephesians chapter 3, verses 19 and 20. This is like what Tim was saying. See, we have to, we've got to focus on who and what we really are. Not what we see in the mirror, not what's how somebody else describes us, but what God, how God describes us, how the Word of God describes us. Because until we do this, yep. we're just earthen vessels, you know, hiding our true reality. Yep. The reason that we're actually here. Amen. Yep. So to know in the, the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you might be filled with the fullness mm -hmm. of God. Not a piece of it, not a part of it, the fullness. Amen. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to what? The power that we just talked about that's in him. So again, we're talking about the fullness of power. Amen. The fullness, amen, of knowledge, intellect, wisdom, uh, spiritually speaking. All right. So look at Ephesians now, chapter 4, verses 13 through 15.
we, until we all come into the unity of the faith, the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So obviously, even though we are, we haven't come into it. I mean, you know what I'm saying? It's our identity, it's, it's our reality, but we're not necessarily experiencing that. He said, till we all come to the unity of the faith, the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the slight of men, and the cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. That's, that is so powerful because it tells us we have the potential, we have the, the ability to be Jesus, to be just like Jesus, to operate in the same power, the same anointing, the same fullness, the same revelation as Jesus himself. Now, religion, what religion has done is continued to point out every failure of ours, every weakness of ours. Instead of giving, a, giving us a picture of the fullness of who we are, it diminishes, it keeps trying to shrink us down into what we understand ourselves to be, and that is, you know, short-tempered, impatient, angry, frustrated, blah, 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 whatever it might be at any given moment, right? And that's not who we are. All right? So what I'm, what I'm wanting to establish here is each one of us is called and equipped to deliver the fullness of God. Yes. Amen? And to love anyone and everyone. Yes. Uh, if you think, well, well, wait a minute. How, Jesus, yeah. he's the fullness of God, and we are complete in him. We have the potential. We have the ability to do that. I'm not saying we do. Do it. I'm just saying we have the capacity to do it. We have the ability to do it. Jesus did that. We know he did. They're, 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 they're crucifying him. Like, like Tim said, they're, 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 they, they're not satisfied with just killing him. They want to humiliate him. They want to just debase him. They want to do everything they can in the process. And he said, Father, forgive him. Praise the Lord. Just like Jesus. We're not only declaring the word but we're doing or demonstrating the word. Jesus was the word. So it, he wasn't just the word, but he was a declaration of that word. He was a manifestation of that word. In other words, whatever the word was is what he did. It's what he was. And so when you demonstrate the word, what, you're, what are we doing? We're basically, we're incarnating truth. Right? Each of us in our lives... That's what we're doing. Speaking, it's life. The life of God. The life of truth, in other words. Each of us, with our tongues. That's what we're to do. Sharing, it's love, right? Each of us, with our forgiveness. With our mercy. Amen? Amen? Touching others. Each of us. In Jesus' name, and with his power, Amen. with his love. Amen? So now let's, from that kind of basis, let's move forward here to Psalms 19, verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Praise the Lord. Isaiah 6 and 3. These are angels around the throne, and one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Wow. Praise the Lord. Yes. All right, 1 Corinthians now, 15 and verses 40 through 49. 1 Corinthians 15, 40 through 49. Praise God. There are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. So there's heavenly and there's earthly. But the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There's one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, and one star differeth from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. 
It's sown in corruption, and it's raised in incorruption. It's sown in dishonor, and it's raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, and it's raised in power. Now, before I read any more, let me remind you that we have been born again. And the scripture says, and I know I, I'm, this, you can't think this way naturally. I mean, you've got to get outside of the box here to, be, to get with me here, praise the Lord. But we were crucified with Christ. It's no longer us that live. We've been crucified. We have been put to death and resurrected. Raised with Christ in, in newness of life. Amen. Now, I understand there's a future event. Amen. That we will physically die. Right? But as far as spiritual truth, which is what we are and, and who we are, that, that has already taken place. It's already a done deal. We are raised with him. So this is what, what we have to look at. When you're reading the, the scripture, you, you can't just dumb it down into intellectual understanding or else you're going to miss 90% of what God's trying to get across to us. Now, I'm not saying that's not good. It's still good stuff. I mean, it's still going to help. But to think the way God thinks is the only way we're going to be able to do what God does. Mm -hmm. And for that, we have to start operating by the Spirit or reading the Scripture. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it's profitable. Yeah. But it's all spiritual. Yes. Praise the Lord. That's why there's depth to it. That's why you can read the same scripture a hundred times and then all of a sudden, bang, you see something that you never saw before because it's revealed to you by the Spirit, right? Yes. It was always there. We just weren't looking at it that way. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It's sown in corruption and it's raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It's raised in glory. It's sown in weakness and it's raised in power. He's making an analogy here. He's not just talking about a future resurrection of the dead. He's talking about what happens when you get born again. So it's, uh, it's sown a natural body. It's raised a spiritual body. There's a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And we've got both right now, right this moment. Amen. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Well, we've got both. We've got the physical of Adam, but we have the spiritual of Jesus. The second Adam, the last Adam, right? Howbeit, that was not first, which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward, that which is spiritual. It's true of being born again. It's true of Adam, and it's true of Jesus, but it's also true of us individually. Initially, we are born like Adam. We are physical, physically birthed into this world, and we are uh, descendants of Adam. But when we get born again, we are now spiritual, right? Because now we are born from above. We're born of God. And we break the tie that Adam had on us, which was being separated from God. And now we're reunited with God because we are spirit. That's what God connects with, right? So the first man is of the earth, earthy. And the second man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. He's just making a distinction between those that are born again and those that are not. As, and as we have borne the image of the earthy, and we did, because we were born into this natural world, right? I mean, we weren't born saved. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now, that's good news, because if I know what I was in Adam. I just haven't experienced, and I think I experienced most everything I could have in Adam yeah. <laughs> and, and stayed out of jail. That's a miracle in itself. But I'm saying, but because of that, if that's true, then it's also true that I will bear the image of the heavenly. Mm -hmm. All right? So all of us, all of creation displays God's glory. We know that. He said all of the the atmosphere, everything, everything in creation reflects or displays the glory of God. But only man was created in his image. Not this, but the spirit, yes. right? Yes. So man didn't lose heaven. Now, <laughs> praise the Lord. You can't lose what you never had. Man wasn't created for heaven. Man was created for earth. All right, Psalms 115, verse 16. The heaven, even the heavens are the Lord's, but the earth 
hath he given to the children of men? All right, so as believers, we look forward to heaven as an eternal reality. Philippians 3.20 says we are citizens of heaven. 1 Peter 1.4 says we have a spiritual inheritance kept for us in heaven. But in the beginning, we were designed for earth. Satan, think, just think about this. Satan and his angels lost heaven, not man. Man didn't lose heaven. We didn't lose heaven because we never had heaven to start with. Praise the Lord. Depressing. <laughs> well, what do we got? The Bible begins on earth. And it ends on the, the new earth. Revelation 21, 1 through 3. So if I touch on some of the stuff I talked about last week, it's only because it's hard to down dump all of it. It's not like the computer. You can just yeah. erase it. stays there. So I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city. I mean, come, this, you know, it's like being born again. The earth gets born again, too. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. So it's perfect the way we are perfect, righteous, and so forth. So there was no more sea, and I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, that's us, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. They're coming back to earth, which is our home, which is Jesus' home. Yeah. Praise the Lord. So what man lost, uh, among other things, was our sense of purpose. Like I said last week, what we lost was Eden which was our environment, the perfect environment for us to impact and live out the way we're supposed to as humans, mm -hmm. as flesh and blood, mm -hmm. but spirit. Eden was the environment that we lost, and we've malfunctioned ever since. Yeah. Because Eden was the presence of God. That's what made Eden different from any place else. Yep. And so if we don't operate in the presence of God, if we don't operate in an awareness of God, we're malfunctioning. Even if we're born again, even if we're saved, yep. we're still a malfunctioning new creation. Because yep. the only way the new creation functions properly is in agreement with God or in union with God. Yes. Right? We're born again so that we are reunited yes. with God. Yes. And it's only then that we function the way we're supposed designed to function as spirit with a body. Yeah. Praise the Lord. So the presence of God is what reveals the purpose of man. Without the presence of God, we don't know what the purpose is. Yeah. That's why we got people doing all kinds of crazy stuff in the world, because they don't have the presence of God. They're trying to figure out something that will make sense to them, that will work for them, whether it's a gang, whether it's killing somebody that got in the way, whether it's yeah drugs, whether it's murder, you know, whatever it might be. Yep. It's a malfunctioning thing trying to figure out how to function in an environment that they are not designed for. Yep. Yes. That's what I said last week. You can't take a fish and throw it out in a cornfield and think it's going to survive. That's not its environment. The only place that thing is going to thrive is in water. Yep. Just like if you take a cow and throw it in the ocean, yep. it, won't be, it won't be alive very long. No. It's not its environment. And it's the same way with us. Our environment is the presence of the Lord. Yes. And outside of that environment, we malfunction. In fact, we die. Yes. Spiritually speaking. Yes. Okay, so without God's presence, we don't have purpose. And without purpose, life is a crapshoot. Life is an experiment. And that's why a lot of times we end up going almost all the way through life. Think of the, the thief on the cross. He was a malfunctioning individual because he didn't have the presence of God. And it was all of his life he spent malfunctioning until the very end of his life before he got into the environment that he was supposed to be in all along. And what happened? Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. And that's the shame. See, the... The fall made it impossible for us to accomplish our purpose 
because it separated us from God's presence. All right? God's word and his will has to be fulfilled. We know it because he cannot lie. And he's told us what it is, so it has to take place. It has to be fulfilled. Right? And so, because of that, God began immediately to carry out his plan to restore his presence. All right? So God created us to display his glory. We read it all. That's what Jesus was here for. He was the prism or the white light and the, through the prism which would bring the fullness or all the colors, amen, into uh, visible. Amen. So God's going to do whatever he has to do to restore us to him in order to see his glory revealed in us. Now, we read the scriptures, so it ha it, that's what God is about. That's what he's doing in our life. He's not trying to get us to be more religious. He's not trying to get us to follow more doctrines. He's trying to get us to reflect him yes. or to reveal him yes. just the way Jesus did. Yes. And the more we focus on religion, the more reason we have to find fault with everybody, and including ourselves, yes. and uh, undermine the very thing God's trying to do and the reason we're here in the first place. Right. I mean, we were in Christ before the foundation of the world. We didn't need to be on earth. We didn't need to be heaven. We didn't need to be at all. But when he chose to reveal himself, he chose to reveal himself through us who were in him. And he did it by putting us here on earth. Amen. To be a revelation. Just like Jesus. So look at, let's look at 1 Corinthians 6, uh, 19 and 20. What? He says, know you not, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own. The Holy Ghost is simply the Spirit of God. For you are bought with a price, Jesus. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Now, we were taught kind of that the way we glorify God is being super religious. No, the way we glorify God is by understanding what he said in verse 19. And that's our reason for being here. That's the reason for everything on earth and in the heavens. It exists for one reason, to glorify God, to, for God to be glorified. And in order for God to be glorified or complete or full, pleroma, there has to be a prism. There has to be something for this natural thing to be refracted through to show you the reality, the spiritual reality. That's our reason for being here. Amen. Uh, Romans 5, 16 and 17. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift, for the judgment was by one to condemnation. But the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. So you could read this based on what we're talking about. By one man's offense, we were put into the wrong environment. That's what brings death. If you're not in the environment you were created for, you're going to die. So death reigned by one. Now we're talking spiritual here. So, and more, they which receive abundance of grace, which grace came by Jesus, yeah. truth and grace... And, and the gift of righteousness, which is all by grace, shall reign in life or shall live the way they're supposed to be living. Their rule, amen, as spiritual beings. Yep. Amen. By Jesus Christ. Yes. Amen. Yes. The problem with most of us, we don't know who we are. We've either forgotten or we just stopped believing what the Bible says about where we came from. And why we're here. And the fact is some people. Have never known. Their identity. Or their purpose. I've, I've known people. I know. People now. They think their identity is their job. They think their identity is the person they're dating. Or their identity is their vehicle. Or their. 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 
talent or their what. That's not the identity. That's just stuff you're doing. It's not bad. It's not wrong. It's just it becomes our reality. It becomes our identity. It becomes the focus of everything that we are and everything that we do. Amen? So the enemy has been effective. I, I mentioned this last week. He's, he, he's been effective in keeping us blind and deaf to the truth. In, in Isaiah 54, he says, no weapon formed against you can prosper. No weapon. But then he tells us what the weapon is. The weapon is the tongue. Because he said, every tongue that rises in judgment against you, you condemn. You have the ability to flip it, to make it go the other way. Amen. And who is it that uses these weapons? It's the enemy. Now, he may use it through other people, but it's the devil who comes to steal, kill, and to destroy and to condemn you. He, he was always in heaven before he got kicked out condemning, judging, criticizing, finding fault. And in the natural... It was true. But God doesn't see things the way the devil sees them, and he doesn't see things the way the natural man sees them, and that's why he wouldn't tolerate it. That isn't who I said they are. That isn't who they are. It may be who you're convincing them they are, but that's not who they are. Now, I'd like to be able to choose the things that people do or don't do that I see God saying that's not them. But God doesn't. It's all the same to Him. I know there's different consequences, there's different situations and circumstances that take place, and we, look, we all understand that. But the truth is, God is saying, if they're born again, they are the righteousness of God in Christ. I don't, it doesn't matter. It matters, but it doesn't matter. Amen? Look at Romans 8 and 1. We don't have to go there, Peter, but it's just... There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, Paul had just talked in, in chapter 7 about his own inability to be righteous, yep. to be a reflection yep. of God. And he said, How, so what's my reason for being? You know, that's what he's struggling with is what the hell am I doing here? Yeah. Right? Yeah. And then the very next thing he realizes, it's Jesus. Yes. Amen. Amen. And he said, thank God for him, because now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Who, and this is not even in the original writing, who not, walk not after the spirit, or not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Which is simply just who acknowledge who they really are, and not give in to being dumbed down to the flesh. Amen? So, even as, even as believers, so many of us struggle. I mean... Every day we struggle with guilt, yeah. self-pity, yeah. very little awareness of our royal heritage right. as our identity in Christ, mm. reigning, ruling yes. Yes. with Jesus. Yes. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 7. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. Just everything we've been talking about, right? That the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. So that we're operating out of our born-again reality rather than the natural. Our, see, our glory is bound up or suppressed and hidden. We, the, the truth is, scripturally speaking, we are all undiscover, undiscovered chests of God's glory. Praise God. God created man in his own image. He imparted to us some of his nature, his character, and his attributes. He created us to be like him. I know that's a huge leap of faith to think that God, perfect, expects that we can be like him. He created us, the scripture says, a little lower than himself. But then he crowned us with glory and majesty. The way he created us a little lower than him is he, he gave us a physical body. Yeah. Right? Because Jesus even said he had to give up the glory that he had known 
in order to come to earth. Why? Because he couldn't be here legally and do what it was he had to do without a physical body. So he creates us a little lower than himself. The Hebrew word, you know, when we're talking about crowned us with glory and majesty, the Hebrew word for crown is a tar, and it, the literal translation is to show honor and authority. Amen? He created us to rule. And then he gave us the power and the authority to do it. Psalms 8, uh, verses 5 and 6. Now, I hope you're seeing what I'm saying. Because most of our life, we can live without faith. A little discipline, you know, some morals, a little G2, you know, a little IQ, and you can, you know, you can make it. But that's not what we were created for. We were created for something so far yes. beyond this. And we have settled for so, le yes. so much less. And, of course, not only does it impact ourselves individually, but it doesn't impact those around us as it's supposed to either. Because then it's just, you know, my dad used to say, you either need to be the nicest guy in the world or the meanest SOB on the planet. Yeah. Right? You either better be able to kick everybody's rear end or you better be able to just smile and keep on keeping on because there's no in between. Amen? And that's where we find ourselves. We are the kind of the smiling good guy. But occasionally... We want to kick too, you know yeah. what I mean? It's the other side of us. It's hard to, yeah. to keep the separation, right? Yeah. That's what Jesus was able to do. Yes. Amen? I mean, it wasn't that he didn't have feelings or didn't have, you know, thoughts and, and intents. It was that he knew there was only way, one way for these things to be effective. And that was by love and by faith and by compassion, grace. And mercy. Yep. For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands, and thou hast put all things under his feet. Now, I know it says angels there, but in the original it's Elohim, which means God. Which is just another word, a name for God. So, he made us a little lower than himself. Then he crowned us with glory and honor, and made us to have dominion over the works of thy hands, has put all things under his feet. So here's the, this, is, this is the kind of the chronology here. He made us human, but then he crowned us with glory and honor. Where did the glory and honor come from? It was his. Mm -hmm. And by that, he then gives us dominion over the works of his hands, put everything under our feet. Yes. So glory here is the Hebrew word kabod. And most of us know it to mean, you know, heaviness or weightiness or what have you. But it also refers to God's glory or splendor. Amen? Honor. Majesty translates the Hebrew word hadar, which is a synonym for glory. And honor also means magnificence. He's talking about us. Psalms 8 is a picture of man as he was created. In other words, the man, he, the way man was before the fall. That's the revelation David had. That's the understanding that David had. I mean, that's what God had revealed to him. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. We'll work our way back around to the prism here. Praise the Lord. 2 Corinthians 4 and 6, for God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, or in other words, to give us a full revelation of God and us, because without a full revelation of God, we won't have a revelation of our purpose or, our, or, or who we are, our true identity, right? In the, in the face of Jesus Christ, all right? Now Matthew chapter 5, 14 through 16, based on what he has just told us here, connect the dots, right? He shined in our hearts. Command of the light to shine out of darkness. Shine into us. You are the light of the world. It's just going on, right? A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Amen? 
So as we are believers, as believers, and, and we have in our hearts the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. Amen. It's a treasure. It's something that we carry around in these fragile clay jars. Amen. In our human bodies. And God wants the light to shine in this dark world. Praise the Lord. Amen. We are walking, talking yeah. treasure chests. Yeah. And God doesn't want us to take this treasure with us to the grave. Right. This isn't about getting to heaven. Right. Heaven's a done thing. It's, all, it's, a, it's accomplished. Amen. This is about here. This is why we are here. He didn't put his glory in us for it to end up buried and dormant in a cemetery somewhere. Or in an urn on somebody's fireplace. Psalms 19, verse 1. And the suffering of this present age, he talks about in another place, is not worthy to even be compared to the glory. What's the suffering? We've got to put up with some crap. We've got we to deal with some issues. We've got to deal with things that we don't want to deal with. Jesus had to do that. That's what he was doing all the time. That's why he was always around sinners. He was dealing with them. He was trying to help them see God in the way that they needed to see Him. Amen. Behavior doesn't change by, by correction in terms of punishment. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, if it did, we wouldn't have the recidivism that we have in the prison systems. And we also know that you punish kids... Spank them, do all that stuff. Sometimes I, I'm not saying there isn't a time for correction because God knows we, you have to. Yeah. But it has to be done in love. Or all it does is create rebellion. All it does is create anger. And that anger is going to display itself somewhere, somehow, yeah. to somebody. Yeah. And that's why a lot of the stuff that's going on, you, we want to look at the person and say, look at that derelict, that idiot, what they did. What, they're a product of being in, uh, in the wrong environment, amen, and not being able to function the way they're supposed to function. And we want to get mad at them when what we're supposed to be doing is what Jesus did, and that's love them and forgive them and help them to find their true identity so they can get escape, amen, from the trap that the devil's got them in and trying to get us in at the same time. So the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. We're also his handiwork. The scripture says. We are, we are created from the hands of God, right? We are His handiwork. The work of His hands. He molded Adam from the elements of the earth. And then He breathed His spirit or the breath of life, eternal life, into Him. Just like God, God's glory is displayed in the work of His hands, He has created us to display His glory. He didn't do one thing for one thing and something else for the other. It's all for the same purpose. Right? So Ephesians chapter 2 and 10. See, part of the deal is, when we get to the place where we're conscious of God's presence all the time, that's when miracles take place. Because, you know, when we had revivals, or what we call revival... Uh, there's a heightened awareness of the presence of God, is there not? Yes. And what's the result? Miracles. You do see healings. You do see deliverance. You do see things happen. Not per perfectly, but at least it happens. And it's because all of a sudden we're conscious of God's presence. We're, we're in the right atmosphere or the right uh, uh, environment for miracles to happen. God's environment is supernatural. And when we're in that environment... Supernatural happens without us having to do a whole lot other than just be conscious of it and know what the, what the potential is. Yeah. Healing, deliverance, breakthrough, whatever it might be, right? Financial or, or otherwise. So we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. We are his handiwork created in Christ for what? To do the works that God does. Amen. Which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. This isn't us trying to figure out some cool thing to do. This is what God planned and He purposed for each one of us before the foundation of the world. From the very beginning, what God had in mind was that we would display His glory 
in all the earth. Wherever we are, his glory would be revealed. The, 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 the heavens declare the glory of God. The angels saying, holy, 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 the whole earth is filled with his glory. They're speaking prophetically. Right? Some generation is going to do this. And I believe it's the last generation, and I believe that's us. Yes. And I can give you all kinds of the, the, you know, the prophetic, and 1948 Israel became, and this nation won't, you know, it's not going to pass before the Lord comes back. So I was born in 1948. Praise the Lord. That doesn't mean everybody in 1948 is going to be around when the Lord returns physically, but it means somebody will. Might as well be me, praise the Lord. Right? That generation will not pass. Praise God. So our, our glory is to give full expression to everything God is and God does. In other words, we are to be the prism to display the light of of the world in all of its varying colors and I mean abilities and realities a revelation in other words Ephesians 3:20 the beauty of this is he says that uh, so when we understand this we stop this stuff about, oh, I got to go see brother so and so and have him pray for me, or I got to go see sister so and so, or I got to go to this particular place and have somebody. No, because it's there. It's just there. It's just, it's accessible all the time. Now, unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to what? The power that's in us, the power that's working in us. That's God. That's the Spirit of God. Right? Remember. One definition of glory I talked about is the full expression of the true nature of a thing. That's what glory really is. When you're revealing the glory of something, what you're really doing is revealing the true nature of whatever that thing is. And that's what we're doing. That's what Jesus did with, with the Lord, right? Because they didn't know it. The reason they didn't know Jesus is because they didn't know God. And when he showed up and gave them the full revelation of God, they're scratching their heads saying, who is this guy? This is Mary's kid. This is that... Uh, that bastard that, you know, that uh, didn't have a father, a natural father, and, you know, on all the other stuff that they went through, right? Why? Because they had absolutely no clue. They never had the Spirit of God. Right. Amen? As long as we're alive, and this is the beautiful thing about this, as long as we are alive, the possibility exists for us to reach our full potential. Yes. Yes. Praise the Lord. God wants us to look at ourselves and our place in the world from His perspective. He wants us to see through His eyes, not through how other people judge us or how other people right. deal with humanity. That, yeah. Let them think whatever they want to think. He wants us to operate through the way He sees us and the way He sees where we're at. Yes. Let, me, let me just give you a little analogy here, or maybe a metaphor. When the southern kingdom of uh, Judah was conquered by Babylon, this is like in 580-something uh, B.C., God's people were taken into captivity. or They were exiled from their natural uh, habitat, or you could say their environment. Right? Israel. They were taken away from their environment and put into a different environment. Amen. They probably thought their usefulness to God was over. Right? We're not who we were, and so on and so forth. I mean, really, they had been unfaithful to God. He had judged them. Their nation had fallen, and Jerusalem and the temple had been destroyed. From their perspective, any potential that they might have had at some point in their life was pretty well shot. But God saw things differently. In the midst of the lowest point in their history, God revealed that he wasn't through with them yet. Right. Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 10 through 14. And that's what this is, is talking about. Jeremiah 29, 10 through 14. 
For thus saith the Lord, that after seventy years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place. Now, let me just think of this. This just blows my mind. I'm feeling it right now. All right, now think. Garden of Eden. Adam. Right? Wouldn't God say if this happens, this is the result of that, you're going to be die, you're going to die, you're going to be cast out, you're going to no longer be here, but if you don't follow what I'm saying, yeah. do what I say, the way I say it, say what I say, not what the devil says, you know. So he, this, is, this is like a, a metaphor for that, as well as for ourselves. So he says, in perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place. Now what did he tell Eve? Or he tell Satan, basically, about Eve. He said, yeah, you, you, they're going to get kicked out of here. They're going to be exiled. They're not going to have access. They're not going to be what they could have been. But I'm not done with them. And the same woman, the same person, the same human that you have manipulated and you is going to be what stomps you. It'll bruise its heel. There'll be some issues. There'll be some stuff we go through. But it will destroy you. Right? So think that way when you're reading this. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, said the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. This is how he felt about Adam and Eve. This is how he feels about the human race. Yep. Then shall ye call upon me, and you will go and pray unto me, and I will listen to you. I'll hearken to you. I'll respond to you. And you shall seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. So when you reconnect, right, I'll be found, saith the Lord. And I'll turn away your captivity, and I will gather you from all the nations. I'll put you back in the environment you were created for. Yeah. Amen. And all the places where I've driven you, saith the Lord, and I will bring you again into the place whence I caused you to be carried away captive. I'll bring you back to where you began. I'll bring you back to your environment, right? Praise the Lord. So God put Adam and Eve in the garden to do what? To work it and to take care of it. He didn't put Adam and Eve there to sing songs or hold prayer meetings. Now, don't get me wrong. But God put him there to work the works of God. Amen? We're not talking about religious works, but we're talking about being in agreement with God. Co cooperating with God. Yes. Amen? See, there wasn't any need for worship. There wasn't any need for songs and prayers in the garden. There wasn't any reason for it because they had continuous fellowship with God. The reason we do it here is because we're trying to reconnect. We're trying to, to get the... Uh, the, real, the reality or the revelation of the fact that God is here. He's with us and we want to worship Him and, and praise Him. And, and we're doing that because we're trying to reconnect. Yep. Adam didn't have to do that because he had been, hadn't been disconnected. Right. This stuff didn't start until after the fall, until they were kicked out. Yep. Yep. <laughs> praise the Lord. See, worship is just connecting. It's just being with God. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't worship. Don't misunderstand me. We, we do this because we're still here in a natural world. But what the worship should do is to remind us that every moment of every day, we are connected. We are one with Him. We are in fellowship with Him and in relationship with Him. Yes. Amen. In Genesis 2.15, you don't have to go there just for the sake of time. But... It talks about Adam's, what Adam was to do. He was to dress or to keep the garden. Sometimes it refers to it at work, but or to dress it or to keep it. The Hebrew word is abad. And it's the same word that's used in Genesis 2 and 5. Tim was talking about 2.15. And it's the same word that's used in 2 and 5. There was no man to till the ground or to work or to keep the ground. Same word. Amen? And so abad comes from a... It comes from a a bunch of Semitic words, root words, that mean to do or to make. And the Aramaic root to, to this same word is to worship. So when Adam was in, in relationship with God or in proximity to God, it was considered worship as far as God was concerned. Right? I mean, it's fellowship. It's, it, he, he saw that as, as worship. So here's what I'm saying. And I'll go back to this, but... When I'm aware, when I'm conscious of God's presence with me, and I'm not talking about when I'm being super, you know, religious, just, you know how it, ha it happens sometimes. You can just be driving, you can just be doing something, housework, just anything, and all of a sudden you just become really like 
focus that God's here and, and you feel it. I mean, it isn't just that you know it in your head, but you feel it. And that's the way it was for Adam all the time. And he's saying, look, if that, when you're in that place, then all, anything is possible. Everything is possible. Right? You're acknowledging the environment, the, the, the relationship. Praise the Lord. And so uh, that, that word, the Aramaic root for Abad is to worship. So here's what God was saying. I got work for you to do, Adam. Worship. Be aware. Stay connected. Right? Because what God knew immediately when they disconnected. He asked, but he, he wasn't asking for him. He was asking for Adam. For him to, for it to register with him. Amen? The Hebrew word for take care or dress, keep, amen, is to worship. Praise God. And in Genesis 2.15, that word is shamar, and it means to keep, to guard, to protect. It also means a watchman. Adam was a guardian, protector of the environment. Praise the Lord. You want to know our job? To protect the environment. Not the EPA. Not global warming. Not climate change. But heart change. Human and spirit. Adam was the guardian, the protector, the watchman. And so, in Genesis 3.24, where it says, he put angels in charge of guarding the tree of life or the entrance back to the environment that he was kicking Adam out of. Mm -hmm. Why? Why, was he, why were angels put in charge? Because there wasn't any man to do it because Adam had failed to do it. Yeah. And so God had to take the next best, which was an angel. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Guard the way to the tree of life. What is the tree of life? It's the spirit of God. It's eternal life. It's God. It's the thing that God breathed into Adam yeah. when he created him. Yeah. Praise the Lord. It's the same Hebrew word, shamar, for to guard. God had to assign cherubim to carry out the responsibility that was originally assigned to Adam for, as his purpose. That was his purpose. That was his glory. Does that make sense? That was the glory of Adam. See, man is the image and the glory of God. Our work is the expression and the exposure of God's glory in nature. That's the job. That's the only work. It's not religious work. Praise the Lord. But because Adam wouldn't do it, angels had to do it. But God also said, just like he did in Jeremiah, but this ain't over. This is temporary. I'm going to get this back to where it was originally. Because that, that's what I said. That was my purpose. That was my plan. And whatever I purposed and whatever I planned, it's got to come to pass. And I'm going to see to it that it comes to pass. It, for the, in their case, it was a, whatever it was, 80 years, 100 years, whatever. For us, it was a couple thousand. But it still happens. It has to happen because God said it would happen. Ephesians 1, uh, verses 4 through 12. We, our work is to guard or to express or to yeah. reveal the glory of God, the fullness of God. And see, that, that's, the devil knows that is so hard to do if he can get you to look at yourself or at your flesh. Yeah. That's the whole point. That's, that's the only reason for what we call sin. Yeah. God's already dealt with the sin. The sin isn't the problem. The problem is our identification with it. You know, buying into it and saying, that's me. You know, that's what I can't help. Doesn't matter what it is. That isn't how God's looking at you. Right. According as he hath chosen us in him 
before the foundation of the world that we should be holy without blame before Him in love. Not by our effort, because we're not going to ever get, be able to do that. He chose us to be holy and to be without blame in His love or by grace. So having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to Himself according to the good pleasure of His will. To the praise of the glory of His grace wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace, wherein He hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of His will, according to His good pleasure which He hath purposed in Himself. That in the dispensation, or now, of the fullness of times, He might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in Him. I think that's where we're living. I think that's where we're at right now. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. That we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ. Life is an unbroken process of becoming. Whoever we were born to be, we were in Him before the foundation of the world. Yeah. Whoever we were born to be, we, will, we already are. Yes. But bringing it out requires patience and the right environment. I mean, you could be born, you know, a rice farmer. But if you're living in Saudi Arabia, the odds of that manifesting are pretty... Slim, right? you got to be in the right environment to be who you are, to be yourself to the fullness. And that environment is the relationship with God. Yeah. Awareness, presence, amen? So how do we bring out the full glory in us? I can tell you this much for sure. As I just mentioned, where we are is more important than what we're doing. If I'm, I could be doing all kinds of good stuff, but if I'm not connected to God, if I'm not in relationship, if I'm not aware and conscious of that, if I'm not in His presence, right. it's just a bunch of work. Filthy rags, He called yes. it. Amen? Might be some benefit, some natural benefit to it, but there's nothing lasting. There's nothing that's going to connect somebody to God. They're just going to pat Nathan on the back and say, geez, he's a great guy. You know, He just gave me this money, or he did this for me, he did that for me. Now, if they knew the Lord, they'd say, oh, he's a pretty good guy. At least he's listening to the Lord. Yes. He's, he's being used. He's letting God use him to yes. be a blessing to somebody. You know what I'm saying? Yes. It's the difference. Yep. Living in relationship with God is more important than anything that we can try to do for him. Because when you get in his presence, even when you've been a bad boy or a bad girl, <laughs> amen, you just feel lighter. You just feel lifted. You feel encouraged. Right? That's because He sees you different than you see yourself. You are accepted in the beloved. You are His favorite. You're the one He wants to spoil. Give you the desires of your heart. You know? Praise the Lord. Matthew 5, 48. See, glory is actually the fullness of of maturity exposed. We grow up into the completeness of Jesus. When we reach that point, the automatic result is glory. We don't have to produce glory. We just have to grow up. We just have to come to the full stature of Jesus. In other words, knowing that this is about God and His grace and not about me. All my, my responsibility is simply to stay connected. Right? Just stay hooked up with the Lord, and the stuff will take care of us. It's kind of the way he says, you know, uh, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, or seek that relationship, and all this other stuff gets added to it. You don't have to struggle for it. You don't have to, you know, hold three-week fasts and all this stuff to get. Just stay connected, and the result will be the glory of God will be revealed. So be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Now again, this is talking about environment. So let me just say this. First, God is perfect no matter where He is because there is no, uh, for God, He's everywhere. Yeah. But He's not everywhere to all of us. 
right? He's, he's only to us where we acknowledge he is. Yeah. Am I making any sense? Praise the Lord. So he's perfect because he has no uh, specific environment for his presence. He's, he's just everywhere. He's all things to all people. His environment is for me. That's the environment I have to be in. That's the environment I have to be in. Not, not just in a geographic location, right? Praise the Lord. So, look, here the word perfect is, is it's speaking about man. It's relative to humanity, okay? It's not talking about God because we already know that God is perfect. He's without flaw. So to be perfect as God is perfect, we have to know what our role is, what our identity is, and be faithful to that. Because God can't lie. He can't move out of his reality. Whatever he is is what he is. It's just it, period. But we, having free will and a flesh and spirit, have the capacity to accept or reject. To, to be perfect or to be imperfect. And the word perfect there means to be complete. It doesn't mean to be without flaws. It doesn't mean to be without error, right? It means to be complete or to be mature. So be like God in, in the sense of being aware, right? See, there's no, there's no such thing as a perfect person. But there is such a thing as a complete person, a mature person. And that's what God's looking for. Because if we're complete and mature, we are like Christ. We'll grow up into the full stature of Jesus. Right? Be complete in Him. See, the glory of uh, becoming, or the glory of becoming complete, is really just discovering we were born for glory. We were created for this reason. We were, we were designed for this purpose. That's what Jesus said. I, I, I was born for this. When they were going to crucify Him, and they said, well, we're not going to look. No, no, that's why, I, that's why I'm here. For what? To reveal the glory of God. That's my purpose. That's what gave him the ability to go through the things that he went through because he knew what his purpose was and he knew what the reward was for being faithful to that purpose. That's the... It's experiencing the presence of God the way Jesus did. Everywhere he went, he healed the sick. Right? Everywhere he went, he forgave. He, he showed grace. He showed mercy. He showed love. John 17, verse 5. I'm going to move along here. Praise the Lord. John 17, verse 5. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self and with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. Praise the Lord. That's Jesus talking. All right? Verse 10. And all mine are yours. And yours are mine. And I'm glorified in them. Them would be us. Verses 20 through 24. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, and they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou, uh, and the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one, or, right, conscious, aware, environmentally, yeah. I and them, thou and me, okay, verse 24. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. Mm -hmm. So this isn't so much about unity, it's about union. Right. So we can have disagreements. We, cannot, we don't necessarily have to be in perfect unity, but we do have to be, be in union. Yes. Amen? That's why the devil wants disunity. Yeah. Ephesians 2 and 6. 
So I can't let myself be the enemy of somebody just because they don't agree with me. Doesn't mean I'm not going to do what I believe to be the right thing just because they don't agree. But I'm not going to hold that against them either. <laughs> because how many of you know, I'm not always right. But I am always a child of God. And that's why Paul said, I, I'm going to look out there and I see nothing but Christ and Him crucified. Whether you're for me or against me. Amen. And He hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So Jesus invites us into this, into this most holy place. Into this oneness with God. Into this unity with the Lord. Where the glory resides. Right? I mean, geographically speaking, if we're talking about the temple and all those kinds of things. But those are all just metaphors for what God's trying to do for each one of us and in each one of us. Amen? So he's declaring this vital message to us. And he says it's time for us to move beyond the realm that we have understood. And launch out into the deep. Into new dimensions of God. That will be full manifestations of God's glory. Praise the Lord. That's what the Lord has said to me. John 1, 13 and 14. And again, this is describing, we, you know, we read all these things disassociating from them when in fact this book is all about us. But he said, this is, this is describing the born again experience. Describing what happens to each and every one of us. Which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh. And dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Full of grace and truth. That's what we're born again for. We were born naturally into this Adamic thing. But we get born again. Not by blood. Right? Not by sperm and ovum. And, but, nor of the will of the flesh. Nor of the will of man. But of God. Why? The word, so that the word can be made flesh. And dwell among us. And behold His glory. Yes. It wasn't Jesus' glory we were beholding. It was the glory of God in a man. Yes. Amen. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And Jesus said, I'm not ashamed to call Him brethren. Because they got the same thing. They came into this the same way. They are joint heirs with me. Nice. And dispensers of the glory. Yes. Praise the Lord. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. In whom you also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. The earnest, praise the Lord, of our inheritance is a down payment that's been made ours by Jesus. Praise the Lord. Now, how do you get the full deal? We pay the rest. The same way Jesus paid it. By believing. By the word becoming manifest. By us saying what God says. By us connecting with the Lord. It's also a confirmation of God's abiding presence. The perfect environment. The environment where we may experience the full magnitude of the glory. The full magnitude of triumph. The full magnitude of victory. The full magnitude of completeness. The full magnitude of fullness. And it's ours through an awareness of Christ in us, the hope of glory. Revelation 1, 4 through 8. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was, which is to come. And from the seven spirits which are before his throne. That's just simply saying he's eternal. He's not in time. I mean, we read it as though it's time, but that's not what he's saying. He was, which is, which was, which is to come. And from the seven spirits which are before the throne in Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings, the first begotten, 
and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God, unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, which was, which is to come, the Almighty. Praise the Lord. Hebrews 9, 28. And I've touched on this briefly before, but I'm just, because it's in the context of what we're talking about. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Well, now I know that on, on one level that, that's speaking to the ultimate future rapture of the church. But based on the other scripture, we know that there's a continuous coming of the Lord. It's, it's ongoing. It's by the Spirit of God. So although there is a physical reality to this, there's also a spiritual reality that is unending, that goes on and on and on. And so I'm looking for the ever coming one. Not, I'm not just looking for the, for the rapture. It'll take care of itself. I don't, I don't need to worry about it. What I'm looking for is Jesus. I'm looking for a manifestation of His glory, amen, in my life. Praise the Lord. I'm, I'm, I'm now, every moment, any moment, Praise the Lord. To appear in His temple yes. and fill it with glory yes. so that I can't minister anymore. It's the glory. It's the Holy Ghost. It's God that's doing the ministering, right? Yes. So I'm just, all I can do is stand there and all go, wow, you know, what an environment. Praise the Lord. Yes. Amen. That's who we are. That's what we are. Yes. And I'm looking for His full appearing yes. in us. I think that's what Paul was saying. I mentioned this earlier, but I think that's what Paul was saying. Not only that we are to look at one another, uh, you know, in forgiveness and mercy and grace, but also to see Jesus coming or being revealed or, or being manifest. When I see you, I, Suzanne, all I want to see is Jesus being manifest. When I see you, Jane, all I want to see is Jesus manifest. Yvette, when I, when I look, I just want to see Jesus Right? I just want to see God manifesting. I just want to see the glory of God. Roy, when I look at you, man, I want to see God. I want to see the glory of God being revealed. That's what we're supposed to be looking for. We're supposed to be expecting it. I'm not supposed to be looking at you like, well, I wonder what he did. I wonder why he went. I wonder why this happened. I wonder why she didn't do that. No, I'm looking at a manifestation of God, amen, through an earthen vessel. Yes. Because that's how he's going to show up. That's when he's going to show up. Praise the Lord. Colossians 1, 26 through 29, and we'll wrap up with this. Colossians 1, 26 through 29. Even the mystery which has been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Or a manifestation of the glory or the fullness. Whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. Yes. Praise the Lord. So Paul had this down. I mean, he understood. That's why he's always using the, the, the word pleroma, you know. He, he's, he's saying fullness, hey, fullness, this is what we're all about. He said, I haven't arrived yet, but I'm pressing towards that mark to the high calling of God in Christ Jesus or uh, the ability to manifest or the, the visibility, I should say, of manifesting his reality, his glory. Yes. Praise the Lord. Perfect, complete, aware of the glory, waiting to be revealed. So here's my wrap up. Keep looking. Yes. Keep believing. Yes. Stay in relationship. Stay in fellowship, whatever it costs. Amen. If you've got to forgive somebody you hate, you don't like, you don't want to be around, you don't want to smell their breath, just forgive them. Yes. Praise the Lord. You say, well, I, I, it's not easy. I never said it was going to be easy. But it's possible or he wouldn't tell us to do it. What did Jesus do? He, he went about forgiving everybody. And because he was forgiving everybody and being gracious to everybody, he healed everyone who was sick among them.
He's beheld in glory. This world needs to see the glory. And the only way they're going to see it is in you and me. I'm telling you, I said this last week, but I honest to God believe this. When we get to this place, and I think the, the first generation church understood it, and it was lost because of religion. But they walked around, and they were so full of his glory that people were healed without them even reaching down to touch him or to yeah. anoint him with oil or to say a thing. And they were so amazed. Yeah. And they'd say, don't look at me as though it was something I've done. Right. This is that Jesus that you've heard of. This is the glory of God. Yes. This is an expression yeah. or a revelation yes. of the environment God wants everybody to be in. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Give the Lord a hand clap this morning. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. God bless you. Y'all are full of glory. Amen. Yes. Let the glory roll. Praise God. Good work. And it's no secret for those who don't in that environment. Right. It's a secret to God and it's a secret to the person that's in that. It's only the ones that's outside that environment. Praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. Amen. In his presence, yes. fullness of joy. Yes. At his right hand, pleasures forevermore. Praise the Lord. God bless you. Go in the power of his presence. Amen. Love you all. Have a great week. See you back here next Sunday.